Many of you may not think of prison education as re-entry work, because after all, prison education takes place before re-entry. It takes place within prisons. But that's exactly where re-entry needs to start, when people are still in prison. After all, when you think about it, everything that a person incarcerated experiences while incarcerated helps to orient that person towards the outside world and to orient that person towards re-entry. Every act of violence that they witness, every indignity that they experience, every exercise of arbitrary power that they are subject to within the prison takes them closer to adjusting their expectations and their understanding of how caring society on the outside is or is not towards them. This is a fundamental challenge of reentry. The lowered expectations and confidence and trust that incarcerated people have towards society and its institutions. Yes, I know you've heard of other challenges of reentry, including finding stable housing, finding secure employment, um, health care, and those are important and they are real, but they're not as vital as addressing the fraying bonds of trust, hope, and confidence that incarcerated people feel towards us and towards their own prospects for the future. This is so urgent for at least a couple of reasons. First, this attitude of frayed trust and confidence is contagious. It's very contagious. Second, this attitude is based on fact. It's a truth. People in dominant society tend to discriminate against people who are behind bars and formerly incarcerated people. And people in dominant society tend to discriminate against people of color. These are truths that run deep and that poison not just reentry, not just our criminal justice system, but just about every aspect of our society. Now, can higher education in prison address those? No. But higher education in prison programs can mitigate some of the damage that is done through the harms and violence of penal incarceration. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you how we do that. But let me start with the numbers. So the increase in incarceration that we have experienced in this country since the 1970s means not only more people are in prison, but also that more people are coming home from prison. Over 95% of people incarcerated in state prisons will eventually be released. This is a chart showing the rate of imprisonment and includes people in prison federal prison and state prison. This is a chart showing the rate of incarceration. It includes people in federal prison and state prison, also local jails, juvenile detention centers, immigrant detention centers, and parole and probation. As you can see, and this is not new to many of you, in 2013, the US had an incarceration rate of about 710 per 100,000. Now, if Cuyahoga County was its own country, its rate in 2013 would have been off the chart. In 2013, Cuyahoga County had an incarceration rate of over 1,000 per 100,000. Ohio sends about 20,000 people back every year from its state prisons. As is true for most people coming home from prison in the United States, most of those people come from cities and they return to cities. Reentry is primarily, but not exclusively, an urban challenge. But it's not required, it's not necessary that we see people coming home as problems. There are also ways to think of them as assets for our communities. Let me explain how I, higher education in prison, like the sort of the program that I run, fits into this. And I'm going to start by telling you about the program that I direct. The Education Justice Project is a college and prison program based out of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that offers four credit courses to eligible men in a medium security state prison in central Illinois. 
Our students take University of Illinois or U of I courses. They earn U of I credit for them. The instructors are U of I faculty and advanced graduate students. And they receive U of I transcripts for courses they successfully complete. Our class size is limited to 15 for pedagogical reasons to enhance learning. Our students um, are very interactive, very engaged, and classes tend to be run more as graduate level seminars than as discussion groups, I mean, than as lecture, than as lecture. Um, our students are technically non-degree transfer students to the University of Illinois. We don't currently have a degree program, but our students are able to earn certificates through the university of Illinois. And they engage in a variety, a big range of extracurricular activities through the Education Justice Project, which are an integral part of their experience of the program and an integral part of the success of the program. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you about two such programs. The first is called Language Partners. This is a program whereby we train our EJP students, that is to say, the incarcerated men who are taking University of Illinois courses to be peer ESL instructors, and then they offer English instruction to men in the general population. So the men you see in these photos who are standing up with the blue shirts, those are incarcerated men, those are the instructors. The program was started by an incarcerated man, Ramon Cabrales, who's in the center there with the dark hair. He recognized that there were hundreds of people in the prison in which we worked who did not speak English and were very vulnerable. And he proposed that EJP students teach them English. The program is brilliant. And the genius of the idea is that it provides a way for incarcerated EJP students to give back to their own community. Our CAVE program operates in a similar way. CAVE stands for Community Anti-Violence Education. It was also started by an EJP student. We train the EJP students to serve as facilitators to a trauma-informed anti-violence curriculum which they then administer to young men in the general population. To be part of the CAVE program, you have to be between 18 and 35 years old and within five years of getting out. Why? Because the, pro the program involves us releasing men who are on their way out back into their communities as peacemakers. We also set up CAVE groups in Chicago, which is the city to that most of our students return to. The groups in Chicago are facilitated by former EJP students. We call them alumni. The, this is very important. It's a key portion of what the success of the CAVE program. These groups in Chicago allow people who had been working through the curriculum to continue to work through it on the outside while they are supporting one another in their reentry efforts. We look for ways to allow even those EJP students who are not yet released to participate in initiatives and discussions on the outside. For instance, this is a photograph of one of our students who is delivering a talk at a conference in town. We videotaped him at the prison, then we took it and screened it at the conference. Incarcerated people have perspectives that we need to hear, especially if we're serious about matters like criminal justice reform and decarceration. We have to listen to people who have been inside and are currently inside, and we have to let them know that we're listening to them. It's so important to give people inside the knowledge and the understanding that we care what they have to say, that we value what they bring to the table, and to give them confidence that upon release, we will continue to value them and their perspectives. This is a copy of our reentry guide. I say it's a guide. It's really a 150-page book that we produce a new copy each year. It includes sections on um, health care, um, getting identification when you get out, um, um, job training, um, orienting um, yourself to the, to the Chicago community, because as I said, most people return to Chicago, and extensive directories of service providers. EJP alumni assist us in researching, writing, and editing the book. And yes, of course, it was their idea as well. A Ugandan colleague saw a copy of the reentry guide and returned with it to his country, and we are now working with the Ugandan prison service to produce a reentry guide for that East African country. And here's what I love about that. 
our EJP alum are going to be heading up the research team. We're going to be training them, sending them to Uganda, where they will work with formerly incarcerated people in Uganda to conduct the core research for the Ugandan guide. It makes perfect sense. Who knows better than they the sorts of advice and guidance that people coming out of prison in Uganda are going to need. And it's consistent with the theme, the theme here being that our students, our alumni want to help, want to be of service. Most EJP students are the first in their family to attend college. We found that they had an incredible impact on their family members. They inspired them, they motivated them, and we wanted to leverage that. So we developed a modest scholarship program which provides scholarships to the family members of EJP students. Now that's good in and of itself. Expanding access to higher education in prison, to, to, to higher education is a good thing. But what's special about this is that this is probably the only time in the EJP student's incarcerated life when he is able to provide something because of his status as an incarcerated person to his family member. His being inside has produced a positive good for the people, he's, um, for the people he loves, for his brother. So what difference does this all make? Ha <laughs> ha. Now this is a point where you expect me to talk about recidivism, correct? Aha, uh -huh. and I'm not going to, and I'll tell you why. Although I am going to mention that the recidivism rates for our program is about 5% as opposed to a 47% for Illinois more generally. And now I'm going to tell you that that doesn't mean anything to me because I don't have confidence that the lowered recidivism rate for EJP students has much or what it has to do with the program that we implement. Why not? Well, because most of our students serve long sentences for serious crimes. Over half of our students were incarcerated at the age of 18 or younger, and most of them will be released around their mid-30s or later. They have aged out of crime. They're not likely candidates for recidivism anyway. In any case, recidivism is a very poor measure of success in this, in this area. Why is that? Well, as you know, recidivism is the rate at which people, once incarcerated, return to the criminal justice system. What recidivism does not capture are those people who were once incarcerated and then released and don't go back to prison, but are homeless, or hungry, or unable to find a job, or living lives of despair. Incarceration is a low bar. At least it's way too low for me. And I, that's not the goals that I have um, for our students. I don't look at recidivism. I look to see if our students are flourishing and if they're having impactful lives. This is what we've seen. In the prison, we see EJP students creating caring relationships with one another. Don't mistake me. I'm not saying that prison education programs should be supported because they help people to make friends. I'm hearkening back to the comments I made earlier about the violence that takes place within prisons and the way in which the environment of a prison tends to shut a person down, to make it harder for him to hope and harder for him to love. What good pr college prison programs do is create a space for individuals to let their guard down and let other people in. It provides a place for students to exercise their humanity and make no mistake about it, humanity is something that needs to be exercised. It needs to be practiced. What we find is when our students come together, they end up creating initiatives and projects of the sorts you've seen that extend themselves to others, that provide service to others. People ask me a lot, well, you, or they say to me, your students are different, they're special. They're not special. There are about 100 programs like EJPs across the country. Many of the students in those programs share the same kind of impulses that EJP students have, the same sort of instincts to make the world a better place. That's what people do. That's what we do as humans. We seek opportunities to come together in the service of something that is greater than ourselves. We seek the opportunity to make that happen, and it doesn't happen often enough in a prison. 
EJP students, upon their release, take that up, take that spirit, take that energy of wanting to make the world a better place, of work with one another, and become a force for good upon release. Enough about EJP students, let's talk about you. What can you do? You can support existing college and prison programs. Most states have them. Donate to them, volunteer. If you're in the media, cover them. If you're in public, uh, um, public sector, give them an award. If you're in the private sector, get rid of that darn box on your applications and give a chance to somebody who's coming home from prison. If you're in philanthropy, you know what you can do if you're in philanthropy. Start your own program. It doesn't have to be a big program, and it doesn't have to be a college and prison program, but it should have at least two features. The first is that there should be contact with the free world. There should be free people walking into the prison. That's what's so important about our program. It allow, having free people walk into the prison allows for the incarcerated students to dissipate some of their resentment and anger towards us, and the society that we represent, and to let go of some of that bitterness. It should also involve opportunity for meaningful action. By meaningful action, it could be anything from starting a vegetable garden that supports a local soup kitchen to raising funds for a homeless shelter. Those are all sorts of initiatives I've seen. Follow their lead. All it takes is a phone call to the warden. Most will welcome your initiative. Welcome people home. Invite them to your temple, to your mosque, to your synagogue. Invite them to your church. Rent to them. Hire them. People who are in prison tell me that it feels like, that's, like society has thrown them away. No wonder reentry is difficult. You can make a difference. Look at these people. Open your heart. They're not special. There is no criminal gene. These people are your neighbor. These people are us. And in our efforts to produce safe, healthy, equitable cities, they are just waiting for your invitation to roll up their sleeves and get to work. Thank you. <laughs>